As you have heard from Graham and uh, Pastor Adriana in, in children's sermon, uh, we'll be talking about what Paul wrote to Philippians. And when I look at this passage, uh, it, it should be a familiar passage to most of us, I think. Um, it, it's like sliding down a, a slide into a ball pit. And then every single plastic ball in that ball pit, uh, for me, is a sermon. And this text is like that. There are endless amount of sermons that can come out of this. And for me to do a broad stroke of this text would be good, but I think what I will do today is really focus on what Paul means by knowing Christ. And I know all of us think we know Christ, but you've heard the term like you think you know someone, and then you realize, we say that when we realize, oh my gosh, I thought I knew yeah, but I don't know. Like, where is this coming from? Like, why, why do you act like that? Or, wow, I'm, I'm impressed. Uh, you know, it goes both ways. But it's really, it's really that. Um, we know Jesus, but we need to examine ourselves today and really ask ourselves, do I know Jesus in the way that Paul describes Jesus? And in the way that Paul knows Jesus? And, and as we evaluate and, re, and see how we know Jesus, my prayer is that knowledge of Christ will bring the type of joy and type of freedom and type of righteousness that he enjoys. So anyway, we, we'll, we shall move along. Uh, Many of you know I grew up in St. Catharines, and St. Catharines is close to Niagara Falls and Niagara on the Lake. So I had the privilege of uh, living next to a lot of orchards and vineyards. And um, it, it's known to be uh, Canada's place of uh, winery. And I got to know a lot of wineries, and I got to know one particular one well, but. Uh, I, I don't know if I should mention his name because I don't know what I'm about to tell you is secret or if I read it in the news. So I'm just going to keep his name out. But it's a guy. Anyway, um, one time there was a great uh, drought in, in, in St. Catherine's area. And there are a lot of vineyards, as you know. And I know some of you got married in Niagara on the Lake and, and things like that. So, and so the, the grape crop was devastated. He couldn't get grape to make them into Ontario wine with BQA label on it. So what this person did was he approached the government or board of whatever that is in charge of all of these things. And he suggested that if there's 1% of Ontario grape in that bottle of wine, that it will, it can receive BQA label. So he can import the grape or grape juice probably from anywhere in the world, like cheapest stuff, whatever, wherever he can get his grape juice from, he can get 99% of that in the bottle and just have 1% of Ontario grape, Ontario grape juice, like three, like a drop of Ontario grape in there and call it an Ontario wine. Luckily, his proposal was shut down. Imagine what would have been good that year for, for, the, uh, for the wineries. For the following year, they never have to purchase Ontario grape again to make Ontario wine. Now, I really don't care about the Ontario you know, wine industry, but as I was writing the sermon and I, I somehow this story came back to my mind, and I wonder how much of my faith is really Jesus? How much of it? 1%? 50%? 99%? Then the conclusion that I came to was it has to be 100%. 99.99% is not acceptable. And that's a crazy statement to make because we don't really have 100% of anything. You know, 100% orange juice is not even like 100% orange juice. We don't have 100% of anything in this world. And yet Paul is saying there's only real faith. Salvation comes not by having 99.999% of Jesus, but having 100% of Christ. 
salvation comes only and solely from Him, and there nothing can be added. But then, when I think about that, what is my faith like in practical day-to-day -day sense? What percentage of me in this heart of mine is Jesus? Do I have just one percent of Jesus to just give me enough Jesus flavor to say, oh, I think that guy's Christian. He goes to church on Sunday, or he prays before his meal, or um, he has a Bible at home, and, and I'm, I'm a nominal Christian. Or he's a pastor, so he must be a Christian at a Presbyterian church, or whatever the case might be. But knowing Christ is not only paramount, but it's the only knowledge that will give us salvation and righteousness and freedom from our sins. Nothing else. You can't mix anything else into that purity and still call it your faith and still say, I know Christ. J.I. Packer, one of the favorite theologians of mine, is um, he said this, once you realize your main purpose in life is to know Christ, most of your problems fall into place. I'm going to read that again because I love this quote. Uh, once you realize your main purpose in life is to know Christ, most of your problems fall into place. Now, it's a pretty high promise, but he doesn't say all of your problems, but most of your problems. Once you realize that your main purpose in life is to know Christ. Now, this is, I hope that you agree with me at the end of the sermon that our main purpose is to know Christ. And most of our problems will be put into place once you realize what I need to know is not life skills, self-help skills, leadership skills, or how to be a man, how to be a woman, knowledge, and coaching, but it's to know Christ. And all of my concern, or most of my concern, will fall into his place. For Paul, getting into the text now, for him to know, uh, to, for him to gain salvation and righteousness was the following things. And he writes it in his letter. That one, that he followed the law. He was a Pharisee. And as a Pharisee, he's a well-learned pastor. If you want to compare him, he's like Billy Graham plus Jaya Packer that I just quoted, all rolled into one plus one more like a missionary. Paul was extraordinary in his learning. So much so that uh, Peter, in one of his letters, he said, Paul's letters are hard. I don't understand everything that he's saying. <laughs> like, Peter is one of the 12. He's like, I don't know, this guy's talking about Jesus, and I think he's talking about Jesus, but it's hard to understand. Paul was extraordinary. There's no philosopher, no teacher, no single person in the history of humanity outside of Jesus who impacted history as Paul. You name it, and, and, and you think about it, and, and that's the case. And for him to gain righteousness was to follow the law, to practice everything what is right and what is wrong. And he followed those closely in order to gain righteousness, to, in order to gain salvation. And he says, in addition to that, if you want to talk about zeal, I have so much passion for God that I traveled the world in order to execute and persecute Christians. Aren't these two things really some of the things that we live for? To have passion in life for something? That you want to be passionate about your calling, your craft, something that you do, something that you have? And, and you know, are we all of us looking for some sort of thing that we can be passionate and get behind and dedicate our life? And Paul says, I had that. And I thought my life was pretty good. And I had all the knowledge, all the gifting of what the scripture has to say and how to live my life in order to be that person. And he says, all of these things now, I compare it, I think of them as dumb. 
I've realized they don't they do not give me righteousness. They do not give me righteousness. Let, let me give you an example. Let's say there are 100 laws and you obey 99 of them. And you obey 99 of them until you're 99. And the last day of your life, you break one. Then everything crumbles. It's kind of like saying, I have 99 fresh eggs for this omelet. I went to a restaurant. I just saw a guy cracking eggs all day into a strainer. Right? That's his job. It is an omelet breakfast place. He has a five-gallon bucket, and he just stands there, cracks eggs into a strainer so that he doesn't, he doesn't put any eggshells into the omelet. And I still got an eggshell. He had one job, and he failed. I didn't mention it, though, because I didn't want him to get fired. Imagine 99 fresh eggs, and the last egg is a rotten egg with salmonella. Would you say, hmm, 99% fresh. Let's put this on the table. Mix it really well. This, it would be just 1% of salmonella from this one rotten egg. And that's how we're going to run our business. Paul says, that's what it was. Obeying the law, 99% of the time, 99% of the law, but if you break one, they all fail. And Paul says, I have zeal and I obeyed everything, but compared to knowing Christ, I think of them as loss. I think of them as rubbish, which is a good, uh, which is, uh, and I've said this so many times, it, rubbish means garbage. And I, I, I read one Bible translation that said it was yesterday's garbage. Oh, beautiful. Almost, almost the right translation is really dung, manure pile. How can you say that? All that passion, all that effort, all that knowledge, it says all that is manure pile. You take a manure pile and you shovel a new fresh batch of manure on top of that. And the next day, you do the exact same thing over and over and over. And what he had, what he amassed, was a warehouse full of manure pile in comparison to knowing Christ. In comparison to the knowledge of Jesus Christ, he says, I counted all at laws, and now is manure. Now, why does Paul say that? What is this? Who is this Jesus? That now he has put aside everything. And he's putting all of his eggs in one basket. And he's going all in on knowing this person. What does he do? What does he have? What does he offer that he just simply wants to know Christ? Now, from this point, uh, I really want to give credit where credit is due. And, and that is T.F. Torrance. is one of those... Um, Uber smart theologian, and there, he has a brother, a brother Torrance, and they're considered um, one of the most influential writers on Trinity, and what I'm going to talk to you about here today, vicariousness of Christ, that we live vicariously through Christ. I just in case you don't know that word vicarious, uh, you, you can't quite define it, but you you know the usage. That you sometimes you hear people say, you know, you're trying to live vicariously through your children. You've heard that, right? You live vicariously through somebody else. That really means that you wanted some you you're trying to live your life through the accomplishments of your children. Like when you were younger, you wanted to take violin lessons, but your parents were too busy and, and you didn't have enough money or time to take violin lessons, but you wanted to be a virtuoso in, in that field. So now you're married, you have your kids, and you're whipping them, barking at them, driving them, taking them to all these recitals and, and, and concerts and, and lessons and looking for teachers and making sure that your kid gets the best chance at being a violinist and play for the Toronto or New York Philharmonic, uh, you know, whatever, uh, orchestra. 
And that's you. It's not you concerned about your child. Is you're trying to live your life vicariously through your kid. What you miss, what you didn't have, opportunities that you may have lost. You're trying to give that to your kid so that you can live your life through that person. Well, the T.F. Torrance is saying the same thing, but in a healthy way, in a true way, that we must live our life vicariously through Christ. That we can't live it. We can't live the life that we want, but we have to live that life through someone who has done it. I, I hope I haven't lost you. I hope I... I so what you didn't have, what you could not accomplish, like you're, I'm, I'm almost 50 now. And Jun came from, I used to be her youth teacher, youth pastor, and she came in and said, ah, I mean, I'm in Toronto, I'm here now. And the first thing she said was, you're old now. You look old now. I can't turn back the clock and become 12-year-old again and roll myself in MMA and become a, you know, like, uber good martial artist or something. That's done. Can't, can't do it. Christ has accomplished something that we cannot do. And we must now live out vicariously through him. And this is, let me get into the practicals and what that means. Jesus is human response to God in our name and on our behalf. What we could not do and respond to God, Jesus responded to God perfectly. Jesus responded to God perfectly in our name, on our behalf. Things that we could not do. Let me get into a little bit of doctrine today. and It's a little bit heavy the first day of the year, but let's, let's do it. We say that Jesus is God-man, that is 100% God and 100% man. Now, how does that mixture come about? We don't know. But we affirm that he is somehow 100% God and 100% man. Now, that's a, that, you, you might say that's all theological mumbo-jumbo, and I, Jesus loves me to sign up for the Bible, tells me so. And that's all I need to know. But look, what does that mean? He's all God, meaning that Jesus represents 100% of God's love for us. He reveals to us what that love is. And as a 100% man, he responds to God how a human being should respond when they receive that kind of love. When they're not tainted by sin, when they're not pulled away by other knowledge, other curiosities, other sins and temptations and distractions. It's like having God in the Garden of Eden and, and Eve and Adam are looking at the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They want to know what that tastes like. They want to know if it's juicy. Is it sweet? Is it sour? Does it have a crunchy stuff inside? Is it popping boba? Does it have caffeine? What does it have? I wonder what it will taste like. They want to know that. But Jesus, as 100% man, is responding to God in the way that we should respond to God that we could not. He made his response upon the cross. Being, he made himself nothing to the point of being a servant and taking on flesh and dying on the cross so that he may respond to God's love for him. There is nothing greater than God's love. There's nothing greater than eternal love and salvation of God. And that was his perfect response that we could not make. We, can't not be, we cannot be like Jesus. We cannot be perfect like Jesus. That's why we live vicariously through him. Therefore, the knowledge of Christ is the only knowledge that will give us righteousness. It's not your passion. It's not your knowledge of the law. It's not the knowledge of all the stories in the scripture. But it is Jesus opened up, not only merely opened up a way to have relationship with God, 
but he's saying that it, we don't, it is not us who maintain our relationship, but Jesus included us in his relationship with the Father. Jesus, look at Jesus. He's so cool. He, he's so powerful and he's spiritual. Now he opened the door for you to be chummy chummy with God. Now you act like Jesus, and that's how you become righteous. No. He included us in his relationship with God to make so that we may have same relationship with God in the way that he does. The way that Jesus believed, prayed, and loved, and worshiped God is the way that we are now all included to believe, pray, love, and worship. Don't we struggle on Sunday morning trying to get up, trying to sleep early on Saturday, get kids ready, and we're trying to pray, and we're so distracted. We're thinking about, like, you know, when is this is this recession coming? You know, what, what's going to happen? You know, I, everything's so expensive. I got to go. I got I to gotta examine. And, and, and when we worship, like, I don't know this song. I'm going to check out. Oh, I know this song. I'm going to sing this one. And you wonder, did I actually worship God? And the knowledge of Christ's answer is yes. For you are included in the worship that Jesus gave. We are included in the prayer that Jesus prayed. And, and you, you know, you know, you, we struggle with, Father, forgive them. Prayers like, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. We could never say that. We have so many annoying people in our life that we have a hard time forgiving. But those who persecute, oh boy. But Jesus included us in that prayer knowing that we are not perfect. We are saved by grace, and we are saved into his fellowship, that we're not just transactionally saved, and then here's, here is salvation for you. Do something with it. But what Jesus does is that he opens a door, and he includes us in to have perfect fellowship and relationship with God. If that is true, what Paul is really saying is that not only we are saved by grace, but we are sanctified. We become holy by grace. That every day, in all of our inadequacies, in all of our failures, when we say, I believe that I have righteousness today, not because I maintain it, because I have stake in it, but I only trust in Jesus Christ who included me and bestowed me salvation and righteousness. Paul says, if you know Christ, that's what you have. Assurance of your righteousness. Assurance of your salvation. Then do we not work? Paul is far away from that because he says he strives, running towards the goal. He's willing to lay down his life so that he may attain. But we do good works, not get into righteousness or salvation, but from it. We're not trying to please God by our righteous deeds, but we are working, we're doing good works from righteousness. Yesterday, I shared a quote by D.L. Moody that we don't, we don't work towards the cross. Cross is over there somewhere, and we're over far away, and we're doing good works and building steps towards the cross. That's not what we're doing. But D.L. Moody says we are working from the cross. Through Christ, we do good works not to please and gain acceptance from God, but because we have these things already, that we, out of freedom, we do them. Knowing that, although we know that at times we fail, and often we do. Freedom that Paul experienced was so great that he was willing to lay down his past. There's something that interesting that Paul says, which is, uh, let mature people think this way. Forget the past, but press 
forward. Strive towards the goal. And this is what I want to um, encourage you today. Your worship, your love, your generosity, and your prayer, and your good works are not perfect. Far from it. But the mature Christians will say, that's in the past. But I press forward. You don't have to circle back and say, I'm, I'm this, I, I'm that, I failed. And I, 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 you don't have to go back all the way to all your sins because Paul knows all the sins that he has committed. And he says, I don't go back to those things because when I found Jesus Christ, he called me Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I shared with you a couple months ago that there are only few times in the Bible where God calls you a person by their name twice. Even Moses didn't get that. Very select people, in the most, one of the most important times in the scripture, when there's a covenant or a big promise, new shift, a gigantic spiritual shift is happening, that, then God would say, repeat their name twice, Abraham, Abraham. Jacob, Jacob. And when, when Paul heard his name twice called by Jesus, he knew he was forgiven. He knew that was the voice of God. He never met Jesus, but when he heard his name twice, he knew. And he said, Lord. Knowing God, knowing Christ, if you know Christ, most of your problems should fall into their place. Your problems about your self-image, your problems about your spiritual inadequacies, things about your future, your finance, they all fall into a proper place. Not that we will never be anxious or never worry about like finance, but they will fall into their proper place. Do you go home and cry when you see a chihuahua barking at you on the street? Like, oh, I did not gain an acceptance from this four-legged dog that I've never seen before. He hates me. He barked at me. He would have bit me if the owner let go of the leash. No, you go home and you don't think about it at all because that problem falls into its proper place. Knowing Christ, knowing that you have fellowship with him, knowing that Christ has included all of us into the relationship that he has with God. Our grief, our uncertainties, our inadequacies, the problems that arise from those things will fall into their proper place. Brothers and sisters, therefore, having 99% of Jesus is not good enough. Not that it's a performance thing but because it's a blessing thing. It will be to our benefit to know Christ more and more and more, that we may experience his grace. It will be knowing Christ more and more for the rest of our life will minimize our temptation to know other things more and more and more, the things that distract, the things that pull us away from the true knowledge of Christ the knowledge that free us from our sins and all the wrong-headed thinking that we have about life. Let us pray. Father, we want to know you more and more. And this is not a quantitative thing, but at the end of that knowledge, Get us to think of our past way of living as nothing but rubbish. Us trying to be the Messiah. Us trying to be our own savior and provider. Worrying about the future. Worrying about this and that. And Am I good enough today? Did, did I do well? Was everything that I did, is, is that adequate? Let us put away those childish ways and truly know Christ and how he has included us 
and to fellowship with you. And let us get us to believe that you that he has perfected faith, love, and hope in our name and on our behalf. He paid for our debts and made a check payable with our name on it. Thank you for the blessing. Thank you for this grace. Help us to live through them and hold them and cherish them. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.